All right, part two. Now this is where we get into the nitty gritty of the thing. So to, to recap what I mentioned in part one and, um, and my other vids about this subject, when a rocket engine's exhaust is coming out at say 5,800 miles per hour this way, the reason you can prove that rocketry does not work in the void of space and a lot of people get caught up in you know whether or not space is a vacuum and all this don't get caught up in that argument with people because that's not important okay that's not important it does not matter if space is a vacuum or if it is a near vacuum like they like to say to sneak themselves backpedal themselves out of a hole none of that matters why? Because of over and under expansion. That proves, over and under expansion of nozzles proves that rocketry cannot work in the void. Now, see this term right here? This would not exist in anything to do with rocketry if what they say about rocketry is correct, that rocketry pushes against itself and that it has nothing to do, it doesn't care about anything. Once it's in space, it works even better, right? Well, if that's true, then this term would never exist anywhere in rocketry. Please understand that, okay, because that is important to know. Ambient pressure would be a term that is absolutely useless, a waste of your time to discuss or mention or consider in your variables or anything if rockets pushed against themselves alone. But over and under expansion of nozzles says otherwise. So, altitude is their big problem. Altitude. Alright? And you can read right here for yourself, unfortunately this situation can only occur at one specific atmospheric pressure on a fixed geometry nozzle. What they're talking about here is a nozzle is only optimized for a specific range of altitude based on its shape, its ratios of its dimensions, and its length, all right, and its overall size in general. It, that is what determines it, uh, what altitude it works best at. And so that is why there is a such thing as stages for rockets. They tell you they have stages for rockets to achieve higher and higher speeds by shedding the weight of the rest of the vessel and all this nonsense. But none of that is true because we already have established that the way a rocket works is it creates action in this direction at a certain speed to get a reaction in the opposite direction of a lesser speed than the action because remember, we don't believe in over-unity or 100% efficiency. So, 5,800 miles per hour this way, less than 5,800 miles per hour this way. You dig? So, rockets do not achieve these crazy, ridiculous speeds. And it doesn't matter if you have more than one engine. It doesn't matter if you have a thousand engines. Because the action is still the same amount going in one direction to create less of a reaction the other direction. So... Now that we've established that, the nozzle, shape, size, ratio, everything, determines which altitude it will work best at. And so this is why stages exist. Because as, say, this is a, say, let's pretend these are different size nozzles. Let's pretend this is stage one and it's a very big nozzle, big old rocket, like the F1 from Rocketdyne. And then let's say this stage 2 is about half the size of this guy, right? And then stage 3 is even smaller. And that's typically what they show you uh, about their multi-stage vessels. It's usually a giant one at, at sea level, a slightly smaller one way up in the sky, and then an even smaller one. So we're going to go on that same theme here. Now this guy, you don't have to pay attention to the, the, the plume underneath. All you need to pay attention to is that this is the big bell. All right, so this big nozzle is putting out 5,800 miles per hour. It lifts the vessel from the ground. It gets to a certain height, and then under expansion starts. All right, so 
What do they have to do? They have to switch to a different shape nozzle because this nozzle is now becoming way too inefficient for the altitude that they have reached. So they shed the weight, as they say, of that first stage. Now they're on to the second stage nozzle, but now whatever is coming out of this nozzle, whatever speed the exhaust is coming out of this nozzle, will now dictate how fast the rest of the smaller, lighter weight vessel can achieve. Now, they want to tell you when any time they're talking about a rocket launching, they want you to believe that gravity decreases as the rocket climbs up into the air. But meanwhile, they want you to believe also that that same non-existent gravity, that same diminishing gravity, is what keeps the moon in its position, is what keeps satellites that are supposedly 30,000 miles from Earth in their position, falling around Earth, free-falling around Earth, tidal locked around Earth, all right? And the same thing they want you to believe about ISS, floating around, whirling around the Earth, free-falling at all times around Earth from Earth's gravity. When you're in the ISS, they say, oh, the reason the ISS works this way is because there's still 99% of gravity up here, or 95 or whatever percent of Earth's gravity still exists up here. Well, when a rocket is leaving the Earth, it's nowhere near 200 miles from the Earth like they claim ISS is. All right, so gravity very much does not decrease as this thing is shedding stages and climbing in altitude. All right, so... That is a contradiction. They can't have it both ways. All right, either gravity still exists 30,000 miles away and 250,000 miles away for the moon and all this other stuff that's supposed to be floating around the earth free falling around its gravity at all times or gravity uh very much exists um and gravity would of course then very much exist uh, close to the ground here as rockets are taken off, or the rocket concept is true, all right, and that gravity greatly diminishes as they go higher in the sky, and couple that with the less weight of the lighter, uh, smaller vessel allows it to go faster and faster and faster. But wait a minute, we've already determined that what causes the reaction in one direction is the action in the initial direction. So this rocket exhaust speed can never be um, surpassed if you will all right the vessel will never be able to surpass the amount of action it's being given to benefit in the form of a reaction so it doesn't matter that the vessel becomes lighter all right and the gravity according to ISS and all the satellites and the moon still exists way up high it hasn't diminished, all right? So now you're talking there isn't less gravity. And yes, the vessel is less weight, but again, we're dictated by whatever that rocket engine in stage two's exhaust velocity is. So let's say stage two's is higher. Let's say it's 2,000 miles per hour higher than this guy. So this one was 5,800. Now this one's pumping out 7,800. And you think, all right, now we're getting somewhere, but wait a minute, 7,800, that's still your max speed ever at 100% efficiency, and it's not going to be 100% efficiency, so you've only increased a couple thousand miles per hour, whoop de freaking do That's not going to get you anywhere into space according to their model. According to their model, you must go at least 17,500 to achieve orbit. And we just confirmed that that is, in fact, the number, not just based on ISS, but based on orbit in general, because on Friendship 7, they said the exact same thing, that once he hit 17,500 miles per hour, he started orbiting Earth. Okay? So this 7,800 miles per hour would not be a drop in the bucket. That's not even halfway. That's not even half as fast as required. Do you get that? So now... We're going to shed stage two because, after all, it only works for a very narrow range up in the atmosphere, up at a certain altitude. So now it's going to start experiencing under expansion. So, what's going to happen? We're going to have to go to an 
even different shaped and ratioed and sized rocket nozzle. All right. And the other problem is, as you approach the void, the nozzle's width has to become infinitely wide. All right, and that's why I did my whole turbos prove rocket tree does not work in space video, because because this has to become infinitely wide, it would have to almost become a reverse circle. All right, it would have to be so wide, and it would have to become the width of the whole void. Why? Because otherwise it will just experience a massive amount of underexpansion all the way to the point where the, the stuff just spews out and no work is done. Okay? And to go back to my comparison of turbos, prove rockets don't work in space, if you took a keychain size turbo, something you could have on your car keychain, okay? If you took something that small, it's barely the size of a dime or a nickel but it's shaped and works perfect, just like a perfect little turbo, all right? You could not hook that to a V8 Corvette engine and expect to build boost on that engine with that little keychain turbo. Why? For the same reason that this, these little nozzles cannot do work in the void. No matter what amount of work they ever try to put forth, it will never be great enough to cause any kind of displacement in the void. A keychain sized turbo spinning as fast as it could possibly ever spin with the best impeller you could ever put inside it, with the best compressor size and ratio and wheel you could ever have on the compressor, with the most amount of air you could ever force through a turbo and out the cold side of a turbo, it would never be enough being keychain sized to cause boost on a Chevrolet Corvette big V8 engine. Why? Because the V8 engine naturally is so much greater in size that as its pistons drop and it draws air into the motor through its intake, that little keychain size turbo giving the most work it could ever give will be a drop in the bucket, a literal nothingness compared to the flow, the amount of air that the void of that engine's pistons are drawing in. So that little baby microscopic turbo could never do any work against the, the V8 engine. All right. Now, how can a turbo work? A turbo works when the engine it is attached to is small enough compared to the size of the turbo that the turbo can outflow the ingestion of the engine. In other words, the engine is not a void. The engine is a resistance. All right? The engine cannot ingest as much air at one moment of time as the turbo can constantly flow. And because the turbo can constantly flow this amount of cubic feet of air per minute, all right? and the engine cannot ingest that much at any one given moment in time, the turbo can build pressure above ambient pressure. And so, that is how you make boost. That's how a turbo creates work or does work on an engine. But it cannot do that if the engine is too large for the turbo. Why? Because then the engine becomes this massive void. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like something we talk about a lot? It becomes a massive void that this little tiny turbo cannot feed or not pressurize. It can't do any work in it. It can't cause any work. Okay? It's just going to spew its contents out and they're going to be freely accepted into the, the void of this much greater engine. All right? And because that fact is true, this proves that rocketry cannot work in the void of space. Because no nozzle will ever be great enough in size, will ever be wide enough in size, to not experience massive inefficiency immediately from the contents just spewing out and not having a resistance to push against. Now you might be asking yourself, well, what is this resistance that a rocket's exhaust is pushing against? That is Earth's air. That's why rockets work very well at sea level and all throughout the sky. 
we could fly a rocket from here, you know, as far across the Atlantic Ocean as we, as we had enough fuel to put on board. And it would do it just fine as long as it didn't explode from be, having some problem. And as long as it flew with uh, a good vector, or not vector, but uh, as long as it flow, uh, flew uh, without uh, suddenly having a deviation which caused it to lose control of its direction and its, its headings, we could do so, right? Uh, if all those variables went perfect. So a rocket works just fine in Earth's air, but it does not work in the void because the nozzle becomes not efficient enough to do anything. It's too tiny, its contents are too slow, its contents aren't enough contents, the nozzle itself is not huge enough, all right? But in Earth's air, there is 14.7 psi of ambient pressure at sea level, okay? Now, what happens and how a rocket moves at all is not just because it's spewing out 5,800 miles per hour in one direction, okay? It's because, and, and if you think about this, firemen hold a, a water hose all the time that shoots out probably 200 miles per hour or more of water. Does the fireman go flying backwards 200 miles per hour? No. He's able to just brace himself and hold on to the hose. So action does not give you reaction. Okay, Action happens, then there must be a resistance for that action to do work against like a turbo being properly sized against an engine small enough that it can outflow the engine. Well, this 5,800 miles per hour outflows, if you will, the surrounding air from getting out of the mouth of the nozzle's way. Okay, So as this exhaust wants to come out at 5,800 miles per hour, the air right here underneath the opening, the nozzle, this air is pressurized. It's 14 points at the at sea level. This would be 14.7 psi. And this 5,800 miles per hour of action hits this air right at the mouth of the nozzle, even within the nozzle, is ambient pressure. So really right here at the manifold, at the throat, where it comes through the manifold, it immediately hits this 14.7 psi of pressure that exists all throughout here and all outside in the world. And because it's going to come out anyway, it's going to force its way out, this air will move out of the way. It will comply, but it's going to comply much slower than 5,800 miles per hour. So there is your resistance. Okay? And it's no different than if you walked up to a, uh, a person much, much larger than you. Or let's say you walked up to a horse, right? A big, strong horse. You walk up to it and you lean your body toward it and put your hands out and push off of the horse, all right? Now, you may make that horse do a little bit of movement, okay? But its resistance was so great that you were easily able to push yourself backwards off of that giant heavy horse, right? Now walk up to a three-year-old child. No, don't do this for real. Okay, let me think of something else. Find someone smaller than yourself that knows you're about to do this, okay? Set it up with them in advance. And let them know, hey, I'm going to walk up, I'm going to lean against you, I'm going to push against you to push myself in the other direction off of you. But when I do, just go ahead and fall the direction I push you, okay? And then you walk up and push on them to try to make yourself go backwards the other way. And if they follow your instructions, they're going to lean the, and, and favor the way that you pushed them, all right? Now, you're going to observe that you don't get a reaction. You don't get this big push off of them that you expected to, right? Why is that? Because the guy went forward the way you told him to, the way you pushed him. So you didn't get enough reaction. You didn't get enough resistance from him to get reaction, okay, to push yourself the other direction. Instead, you'll probably just keep going the same direction with him and you'll both fall over. Let me give you one more way of looking at it. Suppose you look out your front door 
and you see that someone on the other side of your door is about to charge at your door to knock your door open with their shoulder, okay? But you're watching through the window. And so you unlock your door quietly and you silently turn the knob where it's totally open for you to rip the door open. And you time it just right. And as this guy charges your door and he just as he makes contact with your door to ram into it, you rip the door open faster than he could even run, right? What's going to happen to him? Is he going to do any work? To your door? No. Is he going to bounce off your door and get a reaction the other direction? No. He's going to fall flat in on his face onto your floor. Okay? So he did no work on the door and he got no reaction to go back the other direction that he would have if the door had stayed closed and say you pushed against it really hard to make sure he didn't break it open. He would have just bounced off the door. All right? He would have got a reaction from the door going back the other way. And that is how a rocket engine's exhaust works. As a rocket engine's exhaust comes out at 5,800 miles per hour, the surrounding ambient pressure does not allow the air to get out of the way fast enough. And the difference between the 5,800 miles per hour and how slow the air moves out of the way is your differential of that creates the resistance that's external to the rocket okay this ambient pressure is the external mass all right it's no different than your car you jack your car up off all four tires then hop in it and try to drive around based on action reaction principle alone how far is your car going to get it's going to get nowhere but wait a minute I thought action-reaction alone can cause you to move around. Ah, no. See, your tires have to create friction against something external to the car. And then the car can move itself. All right? Same thing with a jet ski. Pull a jet ski out of the water and fire that bad boy up and try to go cruise around town on it. Why won't it move? Because a jet ski is designed to interact with the external mass known as water. All right, and the entire design of its drivetrain is meant for that. Same thing with a boat. Same thing with uh, anything else the man made. All right, you cannot walk out into your yard and grab your belt and lift yourself off the ground by pulling on your belt. All right, and for all of you smart Alex, yeah, you could tie your belt around a tree and then pull yourself up, but the tree would be the external mass. You dig? You have to create friction against an external mass to create movement. You cannot just move yourself. When you want to go anywhere in your house, you have to make your foot create friction against the floor for you to cause yourself to move. Okay? Rockets are not a magical device. They operate just like everything else in the world. They do not magically lift themselves off the ground. And another thing that you have to keep in mind is it's idiotic to think they ever could anyway. Look at how thin this metal is. Look at how thin. Look at this edge. Look how thin the metal is. That is just rolled around to give a nice rolled edge here. This is just thin metal. This whole nozzle is thin tin. All right? And to expect, now this engine's specs puts out supposedly 57,000 pounds of thrust, okay? So that, pro that equivalates to around 5,000 to 5,800 miles per hour of action. Now this 58,000 pounds, if it was pushing against its own bell, which they tell you that's how rockets work, then two things. One, this thin metal bell would crumble up like a Coke can instantly. It would just crush like a Coke can. You could never put 57,000 pounds of force on this little paper-thin tin cone, okay? It would just crumble up like a soda can, like I said. Now, the second point is, if rockets pushed against themselves only, and did not require Earth's air whatsoever or anything else external mass to create friction against to cause itself to move, then guess what, guys and gals? 
this would be a closed system. This is a closed loop system. Please understand that. If this pushes itself around, okay, around anywhere, then it is a closed loop system. Therefore, there is no need in pluming up our air, our sky, with all of this exhaust. They could simply put a cap over the face of this nozzle. They could just cap the nozzle closed. After all, it doesn't rely on the surrounding air behind it to push off of to cause movement. It pushes against itself, right? So then this is a closed loop system. They need to cap the engine's nozzle off, completely seal it off, okay, because it doesn't need the outside world. All right, altitude, air, ambient pressure, all of that's irrelevant. It works better in space, okay? So this is a closed loop system. This is a wild E coyote contraption, like you saw back in the day when he would try to catch Roadrunner. He would have all these little contraptions where he would blow his own sail on a surfboard or whatever with wheels. Okay, well this is the same deal. This would be a closed loop system. You need to put a cap over that so it quits pluming up our sky when they launch. All right? And so those are the two things that prove that a rocket absolutely does not push itself around. All right? That's completely idiotic to believe that. They have you totally hoodwinked if you believe that. And like I said, anytime you want to try to disagree with me and, and believe that rockets push against themselves, you are welcome to lift your own car off all four wheels and demonstrate how you drive all over town with all four of its wheels being off the ground. And you need to start drinking more fluoride. I recommend if you believe in rocketry, and you think that it works in the void, and you think it does 25,000 miles per hour, you need to stay up on your fluoride in your water. Because I'm telling you right now, all this is unnecessary. All this fire and plume, it's all unnecessary. Just put a cap over every one of those nozzles, because this dude pushes itself. Ha! Ah! How silly to believe that. And before I go, uh, I think I've shown you enough here for this vid uh, series here, but um, I'm sure there's other points that I'm totally forgetting to mention. Now, we were, me and my girl were discussing getting a large balloon and then filming putting a camera on a rocket we're gonna buy a we were thinking about buying a rocket and probably three of these balloons not one or two but three so that they can be arranged where the rocket hangs from beneath them ah yes that is the other thing I needed to cover real quick um, the theory that was shot down years ago by the very man who came up with rocketry mister Goddard himself uh, he was aware of the fact that rockets ought to pull their load around the vessel that they want to pull. They should be pulling it, not pushing it. And so this is the pendulum effect. And he basically uh, reasoned that in order for the load not to become off-axis from the rocket's exhaust plume or its action in the other direction that it would need to they would need to utilize the pendulum effect where they pull the load by the rocket but what happened was they shot him down and called it a fallacy based on the fact that he was where he was a pioneer I mean nobody had a rocket this guy was the only guy doing it and he was using his own ideas only. He had no one else to lean on, really, for ideas. And he was attempting to utilize all of the common 